Good morning and welcome to City Hall this second day of July. We're really excited to have everyone here and in particular um, Pastor Jerome Free is here with us from the Greater Mount Carmel Baptist Church. We're going to begin today with the invocation to be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance uh, led by Councilman Mark Stonecipher. If everyone would please stand. Our Father, this is your city, Oklahoma City, and we are your children. We come from various backgrounds, and each of us is filled with your breath and spirit. Lord, as you reign over our city, we ask for guidance and compassion for those who serve in public. May you refresh their spirit, mind, and body with peace and give them the zeal to serve with humility and integrity. Heavenly Father, you have declared in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, for the eyes of the Lord go this way and that through all the earth, letting it be seen that he is the strong support of those whose hearts are true to him. May your favor come upon us here in Oklahoma City, upon our children, upon our families, and upon our elected officials. May our economy prosper, and may our schools be embedded with good learning. Bless, Lord, every entity of this city. Help our leaders and businesses eradicate homelessness and children without permanent homes. May their decisions help make our city safe and increase employment potential through each quadrant of this city. May you bridge the gap that separates east and west and North and South Oklahoma City. Finally, Lord, protect those who serve this city and citizens of this city. I pray that evil and evil-minded individuals will cease to exist in our city. I pray for increased love for, your, for you, Lord, by the citizens of this city, that your name may be glorified. Lord, send revival and spiritual awakening in this city. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Pledge allegiance to the Once a month, uh, we, along with the Kiwanis Club of South Oklahoma City, have the opportunity to recommend an employee of the month. This is an incredible honor. Um, we, we try to remind everybody um, on this occasion that the city of Oklahoma City has over 4,500 employees. And so to be singled out, um, to be selected as the employee of the month is an incredible honor. And I'd like to invite Charita. Uh, to please come forward. This is Charita Bryce. She's with our Development Services Department. I'm really happy to be here today because I get the pleasure of working with you quite a bit, and so it's really special for me. We have a resolution, and I'll ask the clerk if she would please read that for us. Whereas Charita Bryce has been a city employee for two and a half years and is an administrative coordinator in the administration division of the planning department. Whereas Sharita diplomatically and congenially helps residents by providing them with information. Whereas Sharita compiles the planning department's agenda items for meetings including the Community and Neighborhood Enhancement Advisory Board, the Citizens Committee for Community Development, the Neighborhood Conservation Committee, the Social Services Committee, and City Council items. Whereas Sharita also maintains and manages records and record requests. She assists with training new hires and helps staff with purchasing and procurement. Sharita is a tireless advocate for empowerment and positivity, often taking on the role of teacher and coach with new employees. Sharita is an ingenious public servant, a problem solver, and a talented coordinator. Whereas this council desires to recognize Sharita Bryce for her dedication, professionalism, and commitment 
to the residents of the City of Oklahoma City. Now therefore be it resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that they do hereby thank and commend Sharita Bryce, July 2018, South Oklahoma City Qantas Club Employee of the Month. I've had a huge round of applause for Sharita. I have, I have been known to take this with me, so that one belongs to you. Would you like to say anything? <laughs> when, I don't be quiet, so. <laughs> I just wanted to take a moment to thank Aubrey McDermott, our director, and our division heads, our planners, and the support staff like me. Um, it is incredible to get up every day and come to work with a group of phenomenal, talented, creative, thoughtful, and encouraging people. It's so easy to put your best foot forward when you have a team, a cheering squad behind you saying, you can do it, you can do it. So I am just eternally grateful. I've waited my whole life to work with this group of people. So thank you. Well, Sharita, you're going to have to wait one more minute because this is actually a resolution and we need a motion. And is there a second? Cast your votes, please. And look at that. It passed unanimously. So you're good. Okay, uh, we're still on item three, which are items uh, from the office of the mayor. We have two appointments to make this morning. Um, item 3B is an appointment of Lee E. Cooper, Jr. to serve as a member of the MAP Citizen Advisory Board. Second. Yep. Cast your votes, and that passes unanimously. And item 3C is also an appointment of Lee Cooper to serve as a member of the Oklahoma City Zoological Trust. Again, and cast your votes again, and that passes unanimously. Um, item 4 is the Journal of Council Proceedings. Item 4A is the uh, motion to receive the journal, and um, item B is to approve the journal for June 5th of 2018. Is there a motion? Second. Second. I'm, I'm ready. Uh, Meg, I know that there was missing in the packet page 54. I think everyone has gotten that corrected package now. Is that correct? It was yes. missing in the package. Yes, sir. Page 50. Thank you, Reverend Cooper. This, in fact, is the corrected copy, okay. and it does All have right. uh, okay. items from council inserted into the packet. So uh, with that note, uh, we have a motion and a second. Would you all cast your votes? And the journals passed unanimously. Item five is request for uncontested continuances, Mr. Manager. None this morning. None. <clears throat> Boy, you're being easy on me today. This is, I did want to remark at the beginning, um, this is the first meeting of our uh, fiscal year. And as a result, there are some really significant um, items in here, contracts that we'll be reviewing. And I'd like to thank all of the council for their serious consideration of all of the items that we will be reviewing today. Um, then we move on to uh, item six, which are revocable permits. We have just one of those today, uh, which is a <clears throat> request with Prodigal LLC for the 2018 Downtown Fourth Fest to be held July 4th, um, using portions of Regatta Park, North and South River Trails, and uh, parking along the South Oklahoma River. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on this or tell us about the event? Oh, hearing none. If not, move the item for downtown uh, Fourth Fest for 2018. Great. Is there a second? Already? Please cast your votes. And that item passes unanimously. We will now recess the council meeting and reconvene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. There are 12 items um, in this grouping, one of which is the uh, renewed audit contract, and I just wanted to mention that because we will see that in every one of our trusts in our city uh, <clears throat> on the, on the con, um, consent agenda. Move the items. Second. second. Thank you. Please cast your votes. And that motion passes unanimously. We will <clears throat> now adjourn the OCMFA and convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. There are 10 items on the PPA today. Is there a motion? Second. Thank you. Pass your votes. And that passes unanimously.
We will now uh, adjourn the OC, oh, OCPPA and reconvene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. There are just three items on that trust today. Second, cast your votes, and that passes unanimously. We will adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. Is there a second? Thank you. Are there any individual considerations? Your Honor, I was hoping as to items uh, 7CB and 7CF3, which deal with the streetcar, that we might get a brief report either from Mr. Couch or Mr. Todd as to how things are going in the timeline. I know I'm getting a lot of questions from people in my ward about where we're at with it. So. Okay. Great. Are there any other considerations? I see. Are we, we have presentations. We have one presentation this morning by Wiley Williams in regard to item BH, which has to do with the uh, pre-opening agreement with the Native American Caucus. But nothing on the Boathouse Foundation? We'd be happy, Kathy, sir, to answer any questions you might have. Okay. So I have a few. So F1. F1. BF1. BF1. BF3. BF3, Ed? Yes. BI. CC, CG, CI. All righty. Um, and I also have a request, Madam Clerk, if we could, I'd like to pull out BE1 and vote on that separately. And uh, Councilman Shadid, you were Vice Mayor preceding me. So would you mind taking the seat at sure. the end of the consent docket for just a second? Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Alrighty. So, Mark, perhaps we could start with item 7CD. And it's not a, I just need a short report, if I could, on the status of, I know that this is the conditional acceptance of the streetcar. This is the fourth street. We have five streetcars yeah. in possession right now. And then there was this a change is number four. order. There was a change order in one of the other. Uh, resolutions and so I was just wanting an update so I can answer questions. Well David can fill in a little more detail but the but the, the track construction is going very well at this point in time. Uh, the, the the track that's remaining to be put in is on Robinson from Kerr down to Sheridan, a block or two uh, up on eleventh street uh, between uh, uh, Hudson West to tie in and finish that loop. And then we have two crossings that need to be made on Broadway, one on 4th Street and one on 5th Street. So that's generally the remainder of the track to be, be put in. Uh, it's on schedule and it's anticipated that we, again, the completion will be constructed of the track in October with beginning of operations in December. Outstanding. Did I, did I, close? <coughs> that, that's, that's exactly right. <laughs> did, he, did he steal all your thunder? <laughs> um, well, yeah, but, but like you said, it, it's going well. We, we've received five of the cars. We, the, the good news is all the utilities are relocated, and that was one of the things that we were really worried about, all that underground work that we didn't know about. So the utility work is finished, and all but one of the Cantonary Foundations are in place. So that's a, another, another uh, some more good news for us. Uh, we've got 16 of the 23 stops. The traction power substations are all in and, and up and, and ready to go. Some of them are actually functioning in, in the Bricktown area. We've got those working as we're doing the testing for that. So don't forget that the, the Bricktown loop is, is functioning for testing. It's not ready for, for passengers till, till December. So, But everything is, is going good in spite of the disruption. We understand that it's been very painful, but... Um, we feel like we're in a good place right now. And then as far as hiring personnel to operate cars, drivers, has that been done or is it about to be done? What stage are we at? Embark is in the middle of that. They, they have hired some people. There's still some people to, uh, to hire also. It's, it's a gradual process. As we get closer, they get closer. So that, that is in, in process. Thank you very much. Mark, you also had um, asked to get a brief, briefing on CF3. Yeah, and, and Is that all combined? Okay, yes, yes. great. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Okay, Ed, we have a long list. Um, shall we just take them in order? Yes, please. Uh, let's start <coughs> yes, with please. F1. F1. So this is uh, 
cut price agreements for $5 million of bulk fuel from three oil and gas companies. I guess I'm okay, I guess we're not committed to, to buy this $5 million. This just establishes the price agreements for the $5 million. And there's no change from year to year. So I guess I'm confused with the price of oil going up. If we're paying the same year to year, it seems like we're either underpaying this year or we overpaid last year. How does that work? Well, the $5 million is an estimate. So some years were somewhat a little bit under that. But since we don't know where it's going to go, we'll estimate $5 million. Um, but we do get daily prices from all of our contracted vendors. So we know which you know, which oil company can provide us with the best price for that day. But we're not committed. Um, we purchase it based on our need. Um, but our estimate probably fluctuates. I mean, what we purchase fluctuates a little bit every year, but it's the but five million is kind of a ballpark. The price stays the same year to year. The five, the five million estimate? No, the price of the fuel. It's not. It doesn't. Uh, well, we rebid it every three years, but the vendors bid a base price, and then based on the daily fuel price, they will add their markup to that. Okay, and so, so we. It's, it's the markup that stays. Yes. Static, so we the, bid the markup, but depending on how what their price is, is how we determine which vendor to use each day. So you do you have like an RFP every three years? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, BF one. BF1 is the, bud, is the budget for the Alliance for Economic Development. There's 115000 which is, I guess, at the sole discretion of the city manager to perform additional services for recurring and non-recurring tasks. What, what, is, what, is, what is the nature of that 115000 Special studies, uh, they did one this year to assist on the, uh, to evaluate the Boathouse Foundation's financial needs. We've done it for... Um, economic impact of Costco, I think was a study was done, those type of studies that are done, that we, we need some help to, to, to verify and work on, on the economic development projects out there when we need outside assistance. So a after you make the decision to allocate the 115000 do we, 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 that we get a budget of that? Somewhere? What's that? We get, a, we get a report of how that 115000 was spent. I authorize, she provides a proposal to us to, that she's negotiated a contract for specific, and, and then I have the authority to authorize those. But do we, do we see that somewhere, how the 115000 was spent? We can. It, it certainly I, it, I provide it to the city manager. We make, we make requests, and he approves them or doesn't. And I'd be happy to provide a report on where we spent that over the, over the last seven yeah. years. Yeah. Okay. I would like that. Absolutely. If, if we contract to do a study, is that study available to the public? Once the study is complete, uh, there are, yes, it is. But not if it's used, not during the, if we're using it for negotiations, it's not until, I, if we're using it during those negotiations, we don't release it to the public until those negotiations are, are, are complete. We, right. don't want, we don't want anything to undermine our leverage. Yeah. Right. But you know my concern, I think, I've expressed it over seven years, is that is, if the taxpayers pay for a study, the taxpayers should be able to see the study. If the results of the study are adverse to maybe what the public might want to see, that shouldn't be buried somewhere. Anything that the taxpayers pay for should be available to the taxpayers. Is that fair? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, BF3. BF3 is $2.9 million for the Scissor Tail Park. We had a presentation, I think, in the last meeting about the Mary Guard. Gardens Foundation, the money expected for the Mary Gardens. Scissor, there was no mention that we were going to do 2.9 million this year before we've even built the park. I'm just, I'm confused. What, what would we spend 2.9 million on for running a park that doesn't exist? It's, it, first of all, the, the, the park will be up and running in, in its pre-opening expenses. It, it's uh, pre-marketing on it, it's getting the staff on board to, to, to uh, uh, get it up and running. It's to buy some equipment for them, for the equipment that will be uh, in, in, in the uh, operating in, in the park, some of the equipment they need. Uh, so we're making, this is capital expenditures for the park? <clears throat> this $2.9 million are, are essentially the ramp-up costs. As, as, 
um, Mr. Couch said the, the amount is larger than we expected originally, but a lot of it has to do is they need to bring on people on board at, at the, at, during this fiscal year, all the while the programming of income and all of that will not occur until the next fiscal year. So that's why that number is probably taking right, back. But we're, I mean, this is right now, as Meg pointed out, we're now in this new fiscal year. Yes. She told us at full ramp up, it would be $4 million a year. There's nothing going on right now this first week. So we're going to spend almost $3 million. And I would anticipate the bulk of that cost will happen in the latter part of, of this fiscal year. It is part of this $3 million capital expenditures? Um, I believe there's a few dollars in there, but I'd, I'll have to, I'd have to get back with you on that. It's not the, it's not the lion's share. But it's some. I, I the, think some was in there, but, but Brent, well, we need the, to verify the bulk that. Of it, the bulk of it is for operating expenses. But if there are capital expenditures for the park, why wouldn't that come out of excess MAPS 3 funds? There, is, there are other capital costs that are coming out of MAPS. So. So we don't know what percentage of this is capital. Uh, I don't have it readily available today, but I can get that to you. Okay. BI is the Economic Development Trust budget. I'm. I don't think I realize that we continue to spend five hundred fifty thousand a year on outlet mall marketing. Yeah, that was a ten-year deal. So it's for ten years. Yes, sir. How many years into that? I believe we have this this fiscal year and then the next fiscal year will be finished. That's it. So that's mm -hmm. all. We're, so we we're, we spent 5.5 5 million on marketing for the outlet mall. Yes, it's it's capped at 550 thousand dollars a year, and if they don't spend it, they don't don't get. It. In some years, they haven't received the full 550 thousand. We have 864 thousand budgeted to the Chamber of Commerce. Do we get a breakdown of how that? Almost million dollars. Uh, that's uh, we have a contract with them that breaks down the the, the types of services that they provide. They have performance measures, um, but it's a it's a pure professional services contract. And here and it outlines the various type of of um, tasks that we expect them to perform. There's another hundred and forty thousand for the budget of the alliance for additional services for tasks that may not be anticipated throughout the year. This, I assume this 140000 is on top of the 110000 that we just No, it's all, the, it's all the same. I guess the numbers are a little bit off there. But it's the, the contracted amount is only for 115000 Why Why is this number different than the 110000 we just talked about? Um, I'll have to go back and look at that. I, I don't, I, it should not have been that way. So I'll, I'll go so back and look at it. First. So the budget from the that we're paying the Alliance for Economic Development, the five hundred fifty thousand, one hundred and ten thousand, that number should be the same as this. Yes. CC. I mean, I I'm surprised that we don't have a presentation on this. We're spending. This is seven hundred fifty nine thousand for a reimbursement, and then two million dollars for. Uh, so almost three million dollars for the boathouse. No, the, no, 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 the, no wait. The seven forty nine is part of the two million. So the total number is two million. The seven fifty nine is part, of the, part of the two million. Okay, that's okay. Thanks. Okay, so can we talk about the two million? Absolutely. Now the two million is <coughs> the money from the Oklahoma City Riverfront Redevelopment Authority comes from the general fund. Is that seven hundred forty nine thousand? Uh, seven hundred fifty nine thousand of it comes from. The MAPS three dollars, and that went through the MAPS three board last week right. to reimburse them for capital expenses at the time of startup. Okay, there were a number of things that, that, that they bought at that point in time: FF&Es, some kayaks, and those type of things. That, that so the other one point three million is from the general. Fund? That's correct for, for uh, startup costs, marketing costs, gearing up costs for the facility. So we we just went through four to six weeks of budget talks, meetings every week, Mark. Know, wanted to, to hire somebody for however much that was, 50000 brought it up, gave, it, gave everybody time to think about it. It was a good idea. And then we, we approved that 40, 50, 60,000, whatever that salary is. Well, why not? We have $1.3 million coming out of the general fund. Why wasn't that part of the budget talks? 
Well, it wasn't in last year's budget to start with. We were, we were working with, with the foundation, and, and, and as you know, we, we've been in discussions with them for, for several months, and it didn't get done in time to get into last year's budget. No, no, no. We were doing budget talks for next year's budget. Yeah, right. For, for, the, for the budget, yeah, for this year's budget, for the right. fiscal year 1890. So if we, if we take time to talk about Mark's, you know, one person being hired or Sunday street service, or whatever, why, why would we not talk about $1.3 that we need for the Boathouse Foundation out of the general fund? Um, this is July 3rd. That was one, that was like four weeks. We, when did we vote on the budget? Five, four, four, weeks, four, weeks four or five weeks ago. Okay, so can we, can we hear the, why we're doing this? Sure. We've been working with the Boathouse Foundation for several months now to, um, and, and with the Riverfront Redevelopment Authority, to look at private development um, in the river area um, to help uh, provide some additional income to the foundation and to the authority. But during the course of that, we began um, discussions with the foundation about their extraordinary startup costs associated with the Boathouse Foundation and their need to try to reach a level in their organization that was more mature and more sustainable for the long run. Um, so with the direction of the city manager, I began working with them to try to, um, you know, the first, the first look was, do we want to look at an annual subsidy? Um, that idea was not met with a great deal of, of approval or, or um, Nobody really wanted to do that, so we began to look at a one-time reimbursement of their startup costs associated with the Whitewater Center. Um, we identified more than $2 million of startup costs, but the, so the $2 million number that's in the, in the amendment to the lease agreement is a negotiated amount um, that reflects about $760,000 in capital items and about $1,240,000 in um, operating expenses. So um, in order to um, make this lease agreement look a little bit more like the Myriad Gardens Foundation agreement and to maybe improve the accountability back to the city, we've proposed some amendments to the lease. One of those is that the board of directors of the foundation be 11 members with one city council person, um, that they hire a chief operating officer um, and a controller, that they complete a strategic plan, and that they create an operations committee that would have 12 members with up to three appointed by the city manager. Um, that operations committee would be responsible for reviewing the budget, um, very similar to the budget committee that we have for the Mary Gardens Foundation. Um, you know, we believe that these expenses were extraordinary um, as a part of the Whitewater startup. It's a very complicated um, facility with some very specialized equipment and costs associated with it, whether those are the cost to run the pumps or the cost to train the raft guides. They're, they're both capital and operating expenses. So um, you know, we believe that this is the best way to offset those costs, provide some financial um, stability to the organization and um, improve its operations in the future. I do think from a historic perspective we should remember that when the bids came in for this project it was extraordinarily over budget. Um, it was a one-of-a-kind construction project. We'd never done it before. We had one bidder and we had to make some really difficult choices on that end of the conversation to say we're going to accept that bid and we're going to value engineer to, to meet the budget that we had available. And so, uh, you know, we've been briefed on this a couple of times. I certainly view this as an opportunity to pick up on the backside with some additional funding the things that we had to cut out on the front to accomplish the project. And when we look at every piece of marketing material um, that this city provides, the front cover of any of those things are people rafting or people um, engaging in recreation down the Oklahoma River. It's part of our identity today. And I, I, I just view this as a critical piece of getting them stabilized. Well, we, I mean, we've been briefed, but I mean, I first heard about it two weeks ago, and the, the public probably first heard about it less than a week ago. 
So uh, I don't know that there's been a lot of, uh, certainly not even for me, but certainly not public deliberation about uh, that there was a shortfall or that we were kind of working to figure, reorganize the management and, and, and the structure of the board and things like that. What, why, why would this be handled by the Alliance? What, we have a MAPS 3 office, we have a parks director, we have... And Dr. they've all been involved in it. Okay. So I, what is... It, it's a, it, as part of my contract, I can work on, at the direction of the city manager, certain public interest projects, and this falls into that category. Plus, I think we need to recognize that the Whitewater facility in the Boathouse District does have a, a large economic impact on Oklahoma City. I mean, it is becoming a big part of our image and differentiates us in many ways from other Midwestern cities. So, I mean, it's, it's an important recruiting tool for me, for companies, for anybody involved in economic development. Kathy started getting engaged because of the possibility of having some development down there, some sundry development down on that side, and so she got engaged and kept that engagement going along with additional city staff as we went forward. So now that you, so you're going to put a city council member on the board, mm -hmm. now that you have taxpayer funds going in, well, first, if you had a, if you didn't have an operational shortfall, would we be having this conversation? I mean, why didn't they ask for the capital back then? Why, why are we asking for, it seems like a little bit of verbal jujitsu to try and call this capital as opposed to operating dollars. We're going back in time and saying we'd like to, retroactively get reimbursed for some capital expenditures. If we weren't having an operational shortfall, would we be having this conversation? If we weren't having an operational shortfall, would you have been brought on board two or three or four months ago to start studying? Well, first of all, the, the capital items to be funded by MAPS 3 are capital items that were in the original budget that were, that were taken on by the foundation when the bids came in over, in over budget. Um, it's the, you know, the point of sale system. It's, rep it's pump repair parts. It's, I thought it was for the parking. I thought the seven. No. There's nothing, no, not there's for, nothing the for parking. Costs for the no, parking. No, it's not nothing for parking. Okay. It's all associated with the Whitewater facility itself, with the buildings, with the pumps, with all of the, the things that MAPS would have paid for. When the, when the contract was originally awarded. The operating items are things like advertising, raft guides, um, you know, regular, you know, just kind of personnel expenses. So um, there's a very clear demarcation between what's capital and what's operating expenses. There's nothing about the startup costs for collecting parking fees? It, that isn't... I mean, that isn't a part of this. I do, this is associated with the Whitewater facility. Okay. So I, I don't even know anything about that. Okay. Hey, Ed. Yeah. Just to paint a clearer picture. Yeah. You know, eight months ago, we were still in a situation here at the city and certainly at the state with a lot of questions as to our uh, ongoing sources of revenues we tend to quickly forget how difficult things were, certainly a year ago, two years ago. And so some of these requests that are coming forward now are as a result of the improvement in the city's revenues. So, I mean, you got to keep that in mind, I think, with some of these requests that are coming forward now versus coming forward certainly a year ago or longer and as recently as six months ago, I think there was still some doubt as to is this revenue that we're now receiving sustainable? Will it continue on? Or will we revert back to where we were 12 to 18 months ago? You know, some of the larger oil and gas companies are still to this day experiencing some significant layoffs. So uh, we're still somewhat just coming out of a very fragile time from an economic perspective. So I just think to paint a clearer picture, everybody needs to understand where we were uh, as recently as, 
you know, six to 12 months ago. And, and I want to talk about that clear picture because I think that's the bigger issue rather than just tunnel vision on the Boathouse Foundation. And that is <clears throat> what's entirely predictable is that you have variability in your sales tax collections. What's entirely predictable is that you have variability in the oil and gas industry yes. and that you're going to have ups and downs. And so to continue to build capital projects with no plan whatsoever for how to pay for the operations is a mistake. Nothing's all good or bad. There's good things in MAPS 3, there's bad things. One of the shortfalls of MAPS 3 was that you brought all these capital things online and you had no plan to pay for the operations at all. We still, so, so we've just, in the last couple of weeks, we've, we're paying $4 million to run the streetcar, $3 million today for the Scissor Tail Park. Here's another $2 million for the Ballot House Foundation. That money doesn't just come out of thin air. It comes from something else. And I think as we, as we start to think about, should we do MAPS 4? Right. Should we do, what should MAPS 4 look like? There's nothing we can do about the past. It's done. But going forward, as we start to think about MAPS 4, why don't we, since we're the only state in America out of 50 where, where, where we can't access sales tax for operations, why do we continue to keep our pro property tax can't, right, property tax for operations? Why, aren't we, why are we keeping our operations budget artificially low by paying for all these big capital items out of sales tax? Why not put some of these capital items on the, on the bond with property tax and then you have plenty of money to pay for operations, and you don't have to take it away from other things. I just hope that this is one more nail in the coffin, that we've got to stop building these huge capital investments with no plan whatsoever to how to pay for the capital for the, for the annual maintenance of them. When we sold a $110 million streetcar, we should have said it will then cost $4 million a year thereafter to pay for the maintenance. When we sold a 70-acre park, we should have said it will then cost $4 million <clears throat> thereafter to pay for the maintenance. And if we don't have the $4 million, <clears throat> it's going to come from your neighborhood park because it has to come from somewhere. And if we're going to build a whitewater foundation and oil and gas companies have a downturn and they can't make donations, then you're gonna, it's going to come from the general fund and something else will, will suffer. I just think we need to have that. That's the 30,000 foot view as we get ready for MAPS 4. But Ed, if we go back to just our last uh, city council meeting, we, we discussed a report to where the city's growth in revenues was more than twice the surrounding community's growth. I think we have to accept the fact that these investments are producing current or operating revenues through an improved economic uh, environment here in the city. I think we can say that through these efforts that took place many years ago, we are now seeing the fruits of those capital improvements through very improved revenue sources that these other communities who have failed to keep up with their growth have not you know, made those types of investments and they're not seeing the same growth in revenue that the city is. I don't understand. I, I think how, I would uh, have to. Uh, the economic... I, I have a question because I really like the history uh, related to it, but um, this, I guess, maybe goes to Jim. But in terms of operations, we're, we're talking about adding some attractions or something, another zip line or something related to it. How much does that generate the revenue that is going to offset the operational costs that we're talking about? Um, <clears throat> they're looking at a couple of opportunities to do, to do some additional things to stabilize revenue or to increase revenue down there. Uh, part of it is, a, is another zip line that will need some capital dollars and they're also looking at doing a, some finishing out of, of their <clears throat> what the Whitewater building, the second floor of that, to, to have, have some other opportunities opportunities down there and then we're also pursuing having some private development occur uh, adjacent to it on some of the land adjacent to it that would provide a revenue uh, stream into the uh, Whitewater facility. They're also looking at doing some changes to the motors down there that would provide a soft start which is a uh, which would they be paying less demand charges to OG&E and that would help offset some of their monthly utility bills. So there's, there's a number of things that are being looked at 
as was done with, with the study to, to, to um, make it more financially feasible for the operations in the future. So, you know, I, I think it has a point just in terms of us moving forward. And it seems like, you know, we, we, some consideration really needs to be given rather than just, you know, anticipating that this is going to appear. Not anticipating, I, I think we should anticipate downturns in our economy and other things that may come our way that will uh, keep us from doing what searching for this kind of pie in the sky, hoping that if we build it, they'll come and support it. And so I think that's really a challenge for us. So, so now that we have public tax, I mean, are, will these board meetings be open to the public? No. No. Will, they, will it be subject to open records or open meeting? They will no. not be open to the, to the open meetings, no. So the only so we have a city council member on there, and that's uh, that's that's the only change in terms of uh, an outside entity being watching what's happening with the. We don't the the, the Mary Gardens Foundation meetings aren't public meetings either, but we have Councilman Greenwald that sits on the budget committee and provides an interface and, and access into that process. So if if their donations go down, if we have a downturn, I mean, what is the what is the next step for the Boathouse Foundation if they can't meet their operational, then would they come back to us? Our desire is to make it strong enough so that that is going to happen and that we're going to make it strong enough by minimizing their electrical costs, by, by providing additional development uh, down there, by, by providing additional uh, opportunities for them with, with, with changes to, to, the, to the Boathouse in the future so they can, they can uh, not the Boathouse, the, the Whitewater facility. And so it's, it's a multi-faceted approach to make sure that, to, that, that they will be successful in the future. It's their best opportunity. But there aren't guarantees. There's no absolute guarantee. But we anticipate this is structured so that we won't have to provide any additional subsidies. This goes to Lee's question. I mean, do you, after this study, after this months of study, do we think that with these enhanced revenue measures that they will be Self-sufficient yes. going forward, yes. Yes. Okay, but no guarantees. No guarantees. And if they have a shortfall, they would potentially come back to the general fund. Uh, that has not, don't know that at this point in time. They've, uh, they, they, there's, they've been doing some philanthropic things down there too, so we don't know that the shortfall would come back to us. Okay. I would like to recognize in the audience a couple of folks that have helped significantly. Ann Lacey is here, I see, and Chris Lawson with the Ann Lacey Foundation and Ronnie Arani, um, who have both been significant participants in helping to work out some of these challenges with philanthropic dollars, in addition to those that we're talking about here today. No doubt that great work is being done down there. OKC Respond, I've heard a lot about for our first responders. Great opportunity to, to give benefit to our, our police, fire, and their families. Um, and so no, no question about that. Just question about how to pay for it. My, my last, are we? Still have your list. I have CG. That's the uh, contract with ADG. So at ADG, we've now, now we're at $18.6 million for ADG. So, how, and this is, I guess, just a, this is a, a just a one-time increase of half a million dollars. Are we, how close are we to being done with, I mean, is that, what is, what's the 500,000 for? We're toward, obviously we're, we're, we're nearing toward the end of the project. We're nearing toward the end of their services now too. So uh, we anticipate that in the future it will be going down. ADG is our consultant, as you know, and, and they provide a lot of services for us that that we don't have staff for, and they actually provide some uh, additional staff that work in our office, and we're, we're working with them every day. Mike Mize is one of them, Lower Uncle. Kristen uh, Torkelson is, is one of the people that's working out with a streetcar every day out there making those contacts with the people, making sure that all the businesses and everybody knows what's going on. So they work with us integral, integrally. I have trouble with that word. And um, they also do plan checking and uh, check estimates. And they also have people out in the field 
doing inspections. So we have somebody out there looking at, at trails and sidewalks. We have somebody out there looking at the streetcar. We have, um, we have a, a guy sitting in the trailer full time, eight hours a day at the park, making sure that that runs smoothly. So they it's do a lot of things for us. It's really an extension of staff. Instead of right. us gearing up and adding all these people in, we've contracted with them because it would be finite. So, how did, so the $18.6 million that's been paid to ADG, does that come out of each capital investments budget or just? <clears throat> we break it out for, for each project. It's, our, our accounting people have, have uh, devised a way that it comes out of so much percent comes out of the trails and sidewalks and so much comes out of the convention center and so much comes out of the park. Okay, so is this so is this five hundred thousand? Is this is this an adi in addition to, or this was anticipated? Well, it's it's anticipated. It was built into the budget. Okay, so this is just part of. It's just part of our operations. This is another um, amendment, as you said, that's been going on. It's part of the. If you look on the the implementation plan, it's part of that administrative line that's in there with funds already broken. That's not coming out of construction. Okay. Thanks. And Ed, the last thing was CI, but I think you've already dealt with that because that was part of the boathouse. Correct. There were two different boathouse items. So I think that's covered your list. And if, if I could, uh, this is all confusing. I think I know where we are, but uh, I would maybe wrap up with just one comment. Um, and it's a little bit of a historic one, but you know, we began this MAPS adventure in December of 1993, I believe, and we, with the passage of the first MAPS issue. And if I had to sum it up, I would say we have built it and they have come. I mean, there's just what Oklahoma City looks like today compared to what Oklahoma City looked like in 1993 is not the same community. And the fact that the number of people are moving in here every day, um, that we're attracting the young people that we've been able to bring back home, the people that we've employed, the number of jobs that we've created, all of those things have contributed to what we currently have as a robust uh, budget and providing us the opportunity to do some of these um, things that we haven't done in the past. So um, I, I just think that's another 3,000 look view that's a little bit different. All righty. So we are, ready, we are ready, I think, to vote on the consent docket with the exception of... Can we uh, have Mr. Williams do a... Oh, B, you want. I forgot. While he was doing a presentation. I'm so sorry. We have a presentation on BH. Good morning. If Council will recall, back in May of 2015, the state legislature, in lieu of abandoning the total Indian Cultural Center project, passed an opportunity on to the city to work with the Chickasaw Nation toward completing of the project. In March of, six, of 2016, uh, we entered into an agreement with the state of Oklahoma through OMES uh, where we agreed to take the property and part of that agreement was that we would hire the um, American Indian Culture Museum Foundation to operate the facility for us since they would provide the expertise. And in August of 17, we entered into an agreement with a division of the Chickasaw Nation, a state-based LLC the AICCM Land Development Company. And as part of that agreement, we agreed that we would retain the AICCM Foundation to do the operations for us. Also in August of 17, the council passed a resolution naming the Economic Development Trust as its designee to manage and oversee the American Indian Culture Museum. So with that, uh, over the past few months, we've been negotiating with the foundation for a pre-opening agreement. The agreement before you today only covers the pre-opening portion. And as part of our negotiation with the land development company, uh, the $14 million that came to the city over the next seven years is to be used for pre-opening. So the agreement before you today only covers the pre-opening period. We'll bring back another agreement dealing with the operations after it's opened. And the agreement goes back to the beginning of this fiscal year. And during this time period, they've been providing professional services, working with the um, architects and engineers that are finishing up the plans to be involved with uh, aspects, 
to maximize the revenues that can come from the museum to lessen the operating costs. And so for the next two, for this current fiscal year and for the next fiscal year, uh, there's $1.5 million allocated to each of those fiscal years to the foundation to provide those services. And then if, there's, if it goes beyond that, we'll have to negotiate more terms. I'll answer any questions you might have about the, the agreement. So we have a motion and a second on the consent docket uh, with the exception of item BE1. Would you all cast your votes, please? Can, wait, 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 can you yep. pull out BF1, CI, and CC also? Okay. Just vote on those separately. BF1, CI, and CC. So we'll vote on those separately as well. So the consent docket, we're voting on the consent docket with the exception of BE1, C, 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 uh, BF1, CC, and CI already. Cast your votes. And those items pass unanimously. So I would ask for a motion then on item uh, BF1. I'd move the item BF1. Is there a second? Second. Cast your votes, please. And that passes six, seven to one. And um, then is there a motion on item CC? Move the item. Is there a second? Cast your votes. That item also passes seven to one. And is there a motion on item CI? Move the item. Second. That item also passes 7 1. And is there a motion on BE1? Move the item. Cast your votes. Okay, you'll be voting. Yes. And it, so it should be seven zero. Or cast your votes. Okay. You just drink. Except dropping. Alrighty, thank you, Ed. So if I have my place correct, we are on to the consent docket. Are there any individual considerations on the consent docket? Hearing none, cast your votes, please. And the consent docket passes unanimously. Alrighty, so. I'm so sorry. That second item was the concurrence docket, not the consent docket. I apologize. I think we passed the concurrence docket unanimously. Thank you, David. Um, we're now on to item nine, and those are items requiring separate votes. Item uh, 9A1 is an ordinance on final hearing, um, which was recommended for approval. This is a ABC. 926, it's an ABC2 um, restaurant uh, district overlay at 4708 West I-40 Service Road. Uh, Larry, this is in Ward 3. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, is the applicant present? Is the applicant present? Yes, yes. You come forward. If you would uh, very briefly uh, tell the council what your plans are for this property. It, <clears throat> excuse me. It's a um, hotel, and it will be the restaurant and bar inside the hotel. And the hotel involved is the Four Seasons? Four Points, Sher Four Four points, points by Sher Sheraton. Okay. Uh, this was uh, heard by the Planning Commission. They voted unanimously to approve it. There were no protesters. 
Unless there are any questions, I move for approval. Barry, I thought you were breaking news that we were getting a Four Seasons in Oklahoma City. <laughs> Ready. Item uh, 9A2 is <clears throat> PC uh, 10530. It is a, um, it is currently, uh, so that 1508 North Chartel Avenue, it is currently single family residential and would be uh, rezoned to I-1 Light Industrial. And Ed, this is in Ward 2. Did anybody sign up to speak? No. This had unanimous planning commission approval, no protesters. I move for approval. Second, cast your votes, and the item passes unanimously. Item 9A3 uh, is an ordinance again on final hearing uh, recommended for approval. This is uh, 100 North Morgan Road uh, from PUD 1509 to I-2 Moderate Industrial. And this is in Ward 1, James. Yeah, this is a, uh, it, it, it's currently zoned PUD 1509, and it, uh, allows a uh, uh, metal recycling and this was early on when, when I was first elected they we there was a pretty contentious and so now it's actually getting changed back to I2 which is um, probably better for the thing uh, you know I, I still uh, think that the rezoning it was the property owner wanted to do that and now he doesn't want to do that anymore he wants to get rid of the 12 foot screening so we're just going back everything is i2 it's, it was unanimous approval and uh so with that i, I move for approval second cast your votes and the item passes unanimously uh item uh, 9a4 is uh spud uh, 1057 13433 northwest expressway from um Agricultural uh, District to SPUD 1057, SPUD, and this is also in Ward 1, James. Has anybody signed up for this? Uh, the applicant is. Is that just the applicant? Okay. Um, this is just a, a spread that limits the, to uh, lawn and garden sales and services. It got staff approval and a planning commission unanimous approval, so that I move for approval. Second. Second. Yes, your votes. And it passes unanimously. Item 9A5 uh, is a, a SPUD 1058. The address is 1229 Northwest 102nd Street uh, from R1 single family residential to SPUD 1058 in Ward 2. Commission approval. I move for approval. Great. Ready? Cast your votes. And that item passes unanimously. Looks like that's development of a senior multifamily center in here, which is great. Um, item 10B um, is, an, again, an ordinance on final hearing. This is ordinance number 25,931, closing an alleyway at north of uh, 141 Northeast 13th Street. I believe that we did this at a previous meeting, and this is a Scrivener's error that's been corrected. Right. Uh, anyone to speak on it? Uh, if not, uh, this is just uh, simply closing an alleyway. alleyway that is really a dead end uh, for an office complex that I'm at an office building that I'm excited to see it moving from the eyesore that it is uh, to being developed. So I'll move for uh, approval. Second. Please cast your votes. And the item passes unanimously. Uh, moving on to 9C1, um, and actually 9C1 through 9C8 are all uh, traffic matters um, in Ward 6. Uh, each one of them uh, relates to uh, parking for uh, physically disabled or um, full-time reserve parking uh, by the Courthouse on Chartel. So if we could move through these fairly quickly. Um, I need a motion for 9C1. Move, move the item. Second. And the motion passes unanimously. 9C2. Move the item. Second. Item passes unanimously. 9C3. Move the item. Second. Item passes unanimously. 9C4. Move the item. Second. Whoops. Item passes unanimously. 
9C5. Item. item passes unanimously. 9C6. Item. That item passes unanimously. 9C7. Item. That item passes unanimously. And 9C8. Item. That item passes unanimously. Thank you very much. So, uh, on to item 9D. I believe we have a presentation by Aubrey McDermott, with our, who is our planning director. Thank you. Good morning, council. Um, I wanted to talk about um, a proposed ordinance amendment, and this affects our alcoholic beverage and consumption zoning. Um, this is something that uh, city staff and partners have been working on for the past three years. We've been working with Development Services Department, Municipal Counselor, Police Department, Planning Commission, and then local breweries and businesses. So the, the purpose of these amendments is first, we need to address some state law changes that have happened or will be effective this fall. And then the second is just to, to address our zoning requirements for alcoholic beverage and consumption. Um, this ordinance does not affect licensing, a city license in addition to those licenses um, that are given by the state, by the ABLE Commission, are still required for everything we're talking about today. But this ordinance really primarily just focuses on zoning that permits on-premises consumption of alcoholic beverages for restaurants and bars and um, other uses. So um, quickly, just to, to reference the state laws that have affected our ordinances, Several years ago, uh, state law allowed tap rooms at breweries. We're starting to address that because we didn't have definitions that met the same definitions as state laws. Um, also effective last October was a state law that allowed beer, wine, and mixed beverage consumptions in movie theaters. And then this fall, another state law will go into effect that eliminates low point beer and allows beer and wine sales in grocery stores and convenience stores. And our current zoning and codes did not conform to these changes. So in addition to knowing that we had to update our code to be consistent with state law, we also realized there was a, um, a need to make some changes because we've identified some issues within our current zoning process. Um, what currently happens right now is that restaurants and bars that want to sell or serve alcoholic beverages have to rezone their property. So they either rezone it to a specific zoning overlay, which these are called ABC 1, 2, and 3, three different levels, or they have to rezone their property to a PUD or SPUD. So the issue with that is that zoning stays with the land. Zoning does not expire. So once a business is determined, once a business determines they want to sell alcohol, any future business that's located on that site still has those permissions attached to its zoning. Um, those permissions are very hard to enforce and revoke. It's a zoning enforcement issue rather than a licensing or permitting issue otherwise. So um, the, other, the other issue that's come up is that when an applicant comes in to receive an ABC zoning overlay, that process doesn't have any specific guidelines or criteria that decision makers can apply. So typically it's just kind of a judgment of whether or not it's an appropriate use. And we also didn't have any processes to allow the sale or consumption of alcohol for other types of businesses than restaurants or bars um, that would like to serve that accessory to their primary use. And I, and I talked through the whole slide without the points that I was stressing up there. So there, that's what I just said. <laughs> okay, and so what we wanted to do is to look at how other cities permit alcoholic beverage consumption. We looked at several cities within Oklahoma so that we could understand how other cities are dealing with the, the same state law requirements. And we looked at some peer cities around the country. And what our research found is that we could only find that Oklahoma City regulated the alcoholic beverage consumption through a zoning overlay. The other cities that we researched would allow restaurants to serve alcohol if the restaurant was allowed in certain zoning districts. And other cities also allowed bars to exist in certain zoning districts. Norman was an exception in that they limited that right to just their downtown or Main Street. And about half of the cities we looked at utilized tools like special permits or exceptions in specific zoning districts. So that's what we found to be the best practice, and we found that that worked within our current zoning structure. So our proposed ordinance 
updates the state law requirements and it proposes to eliminate the zoning overlay classification for those alcoholic beverage consumption so rather what we're doing is establishing new processes that allow the sales service and consumption either by right or as a conditional use or as a, a special permit and and this is how that breaks down so the by right is uh, replacing the ABC1 zoning overlay process, and this applies to restaurants, restaurants that serve limited alcohol, which is just beer and wine. If those restaurants are permitted to exist in the zoning districts that allow restaurants, by right, they can serve beer and wine. Then we move to the conditional use, and this is a type of use that puts conditions on a specific type of use. If you meet the conditions, you can move forward to getting your permitting. So this process would require, would replace the ABC2 overlay process, which is when restaurants might want to serve alcohol or have an accessory bar. So this would be uh, cocktails instead of just beer and wine. So if the restaurants are allowed in, this, in the zoning district and they meet certain conditions, they can go straight to the permitting process. Aubrey, may I ask you a question on the previous slide? Mm -hmm an area that's already zoned to allow restaurants but that restaurant never uh, applied for a, the ability to sell beer or wine automatically now can begin selling beer and wine they would any, have to go get the proper licenses to do through so the state. through the city and the state they would oh. still be required to do that but they wouldn't have to rezone their property to do so okay thank you okay so um Conditions on the conditional use, these are primarily intended to limit impacts on nearby residential uses. So the conditions are to help screen any exterior lighting. Um, if outdoor seating is offered by that restaurant and it's used between 11 p.m. and 8 a.m., it must be at least 100 feet from the nearest property line of a residential use. And it limits the size of the facility that can get these uh, conditional uses to those less than 15,000 square feet. So if a development is a large development, it might have more significant impacts to adjacent residential than they'd go through a different process. This process is also identified in our zoning use unit categories for other types of businesses. So they would go through this same type of process, meeting certain conditions. And these would be other businesses like salons, um, commercial uses that are not a restaurant. And they must additionally meet state and city licensing requirements and comply with building code because restaurants must be built to um, accommodate assembly uses. Other businesses that might be small might not be up to code if they're offering um, accessory alcohol beverage consumption. So it's another check um, that they, they would have to meet. So if any of these uh, restaurants or other businesses cannot meet the conditions, then they're able to apply for a special permit, which is a, another level up of review. The special permit also is the mechanism that would replace the ABC3 overlay. So this would be for all bars and taverns, or if those other uses can't meet conditions, they could come in and apply for this permit. And um, other than the specific business types that we identified would be appropriate for the cond conditional use, any other business to come in and apply for this special permit. So would the special permits come before the city council or just be they do. administrative? That's one of the benefits of having a special permit process because these do require you to go before planning commission and city council for approval. So there's public hearings attached to both of these. So anytime there's a, a, a more intense application, like a bar or a tavern or a use that's questionable, large uh, use that's over 15,000 square feet, you might want to look at that individually. The other benefit for special permits is that every special permit has, a, has conditions listed as reasons why you would need special consideration and reasons why the Planning Commission and City Council could have specific conditions attached to that. And some of those that might be important for this alcoholic beverage or consumption uh, bar and tavern use is that uh, they do not adversely affect the use of neighboring properties that they have adequate public facilities to serve the proposed use, and that specific conditions regarding the location, design, and operation assure safety, prevent nuisance, and control noxious effects of things like sound and light. So with those 
listed in the, in the zoning ordinance, additional customized conditions can be imposed by City Council or the Planning Commission to make these uses compatible with their neighbors. We want to revoke a permit because it's a nuisance. How quickly can we do it? I think you place it on the City Council docket, um, and it's just an action of City Council to declare property a nuisance. And, and as you see, the next bullet there allows council to do that for these special permits. They may be revoked. And the other thing is that if the state revokes the operator's license, then the city revokes the special permit. Um, another benefit of special permits is that they expire if the use isn't built or initiated within 12 months. The other thing is if the use goes away or stands vacant for a period of 12 months, then the special permit is immediately expired. That way the next operator who comes in would have to go back through the process again. Okay, uh, we made several other minor amendments. Um, one being just providing clarification now that our use units weren't consistent with state law changes, so we updated them for things like references to low point beer. Uh, we also had to come up with a way to interpret how existing PUDs and SPUDs dealt with restaurants and bars and specific uses which those uses are not, the definitions have changed. So we were able to identify if those PUDs and SPUDs specifically called out the ability for a restaurant to serve alcohol or not. If the PUD does not, um, if it prevents that or specifically doesn't mention that, then those PUDs would either have to come back in for rezoning or go through another process of approval. Um, in addition, uh, the, the issues for state law changes for things, for the breweries is when the state law added the ability for breweries to have a tap room on site, we didn't have a definition for that, so we created a definition, and it can exist accessory to the, to the brewery in Oklahoma City where the breweries are allowed in industrial zoning districts and certain uh, other districts, and um, we just made our language consistent with what the city's zoning and state law permitted. Okay, so that takes us through the bulk of the amendments, and I just wanted to give you a brief view of the background in that we started this process in 2015 and had an ordinance ready to go. Planning Commission recommended approval in 2016 and that's when more state laws changed. So we went back to address the ordinance again, been working on it, uh, we've, we've been working on it with the brewers and uh, with the business owners and the Planning Commission and have gotten to a point where we feel like the, the ordinance is the best that we can make it within our code structure to accomplish everything that we needed to. And where we're going with this now is that Planning Commission has recommended that Council approve the ordinance and we're introducing it today. And we'll have two more public hearings and we'll receive comments uh, from the Council and from public during this process. We also did establish the effective date of the ordinance to be the date that the state law goes into effect, which is October 1st. And I have a great team of experts behind me. <laughs> Bob Tiener with Development Services and Sarah Welch from Planning Department and the Municipal Counselor's Office. So if you have any specific questions that I can't answer, our team is available for you. Aubrey, thank you very much. That's a lot of work and a long timeline to accomplish this. Are there questions or comments? Yeah, I do have a question. Cost to uh, business owner with going through the new process mm -hmm. versus doing the rezoning? Is right. it going to be cheaper for them or kind of neutral or? Well, the... Um, the cost to rezone to the ABC overlay, if your restaurant is $1,500, so those restaurants now that would comply with that by right would save that money because they would not be required to rezone. The restaurants that can meet the conditions to have a bar on site no longer have to apply for an overlay, so that was a $1,600 permit. Bars and taverns, those that would have to come in for an ABC3 overlay, instead of paying the 1600 to rezone to ABC3, they'd have to go to a special permit process, which is a little bit higher fee. It's $2,700, so it's about $1,000 more for restaurants and bars than it would have been under the ABC3 process previously. Um, the special permit price is about, it is exactly the same price as we charge to rezone to a PUD or SPUD, and many of the... Um, uses that would come in to sell alcohol or serve alcohol that didn't fit the restaurant model had to rezone to a PUD or SPUD. So it's the same price for them. Okay. Thank you. All right. Question, and this may not be the right time to ask, and I apologize if it's not. 
is there going to be any impact in this new um, scheme of things on adult entertainment? I don't think that this ordinance affects so it's a dying that. Issue. Um, I, I, and I'm not sure if those adult entertainment uses fall within the category. If they wanted to serve, they could request a special permit. Is that true? <laughs> That's interesting. I don't want to be the adult entertainment expert, but <laughs> uh, I do believe they can make application for a special permit because they're allowed in those zoning districts that uh, the commercial zoning districts now. So we, we, the ordinance really doesn't impact how they uh, how we deal with them. So, were there uh, other questions, James? Did you have a comment? Uh, con conditional uses. How, how are those approved? I, you maybe you said that, and I just. But, Basically, the permit center would review the zoning and make sure the zoning was correct and then review those conditions. And if the project proposal and the plans and the location of the outdoor seating complied, they would just proceed to issue the permit. Okay. So they wouldn't have to come before any um, body for approval. And, and, how, and how much does that, that process cost? But it would just be the price of the permit based on what use they were getting a permit to do. Okay. Thanks. Anybody else? Comments or questions? Mr. Cooper? No, I, I don't have any uh, a question, really. Uh, I, I uh, just want to really commend planning, uh, Aubrey, all of the staff. I know the painstaking effort that went into really putting this all together, the research that went into it, mm -hmm. making us uh, compatible with other cities, um, really looking at our processes in our city and what that looks like in terms of business owners who are trying to develop uh, their businesses, considerations that were outside of the box, uh, all of those went into making this happen. And uh, in many ways, I feel a little ownership today. Uh, so thank you for just a fantastic presentation and, and a proposal. Thank you. Thank you. You were definitely a part of all of those meetings with Planning Commission hashing through the details. So I appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, Alrighty. Can, can I ask you something very tangential? So, on medical marijuana, do you just wait for the state, or is the planning department and city, are we gearing up in any way, or we just wait and see what the... Now, uh, Susan and Laura are already working on medical marijuana. There are ordinance for that, so... Is the planning department... There's involved? not... We have met with the municipal yeah. counselor's office to review how zoning would be impacted. There's not a whole lot that we can do on that. The, the state law even says you can't unduly change your zoning ordinances to restrict. Okay. Right. So we'll, we'll be back with you on that. Thank you. <laughs> I expected that question might come up. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, well this uh, 9D uh, ordinance was just to be introduced today. Yes. Thank you for your presentation, Aubrey, and we'll be back with two public hearings, as you mentioned, the next council meetings. Um, so we need to, uh, there's a motion to move this forward, is there a second? Second. Thank you. And the motion passes unanimously. Uh, item 9E is another ordinance to be introduced, and Doug Cupper, our parks director, is going to make a presentation. We don't have a presentation on this one, but uh, David's getting ready for our next one. Uh, the Game and Fish Commission has been evaluating our, our operations for close to home waters for uh, quite a while. Uh, definitely been reviewing it for the four years that I've been here to make sure that our fisheries program is a sustainable program. Uh, it, uh, it's one of the few sustainable sections of the Parks and Recreation Department. The, the fees that people pay into the city system for a City of Oklahoma City fishing permit helps to sustain our urban fisheries program, our fisheries biologist, his part-time staff, and our ability to stock nearly a million fish a year in our close-to-home bodies of water and the water utilities reservoirs. Well, one of the things that they've been struggling with, the fees have not changed significantly for a number of years. We heard a lot of comments, uh, especially from our retailers that sell the permits, the, the Walmarts and the Bass Pros, that 
uh, the tourism uptick that we have had that we're experiencing here in Oklahoma City, uh, the people that want to be able to fish, they get a one-day permit, it's for that day. Well, if they buy it at 5 o'clock in the evening for that day, they can't fish the next day. So we, we deliberately looked at trying to figure out whether we do away with the one-day permit or we create a three-day permit to get rid of the one-day. Uh, the, the Game and Fish Commission deliberated. We had a number of public meetings on the subject. Uh, it was decided to keep the one day, but also add a three day for the first time to our offerings. That way we can accommodate the tourism that comes to town that wants to capitalize on uh, the large fish populations we have. And we've been, uh, our fishermen have been pulling out some state records lately out of some of our bodies of water, so we're ex excited about that. This is in a partnership with the state fish and game folks. They give us the fry. We put them in our 10 ponds out at Hefner. We grow them out to a significant size so that they're uh, then introduced into our close to homes. And in a few months, in some cases, the hybrids are worth catching a few months later, a year later, then we, we have some record fish growing out there. So. Um, this is a, an ordinance change that's being introduced today. Public hearing will be in two weeks. Final reading will be uh, at the end, of, the end of the month to go into effect in, uh, on September 1st. Be happy to answer any questions. Doug, would it, would it be too difficult to change the one-day permit to a 24-hour permit? I mean, could you date, stamp the permit? But in essence, it is a 24-hour uh, permit, but with, like I said, if somebody hits a Walmart at 8 o'clock in the, in the evening or a Bass Pro before they close, you know, they only have the early morning hours, and, and most of our visitors that are avid fishermen want to spend more time on the water than that 24 hours. So, so again, it, it gives them the option to go with a 24-hour. They can get that, or they can go the three-day and spend more time on our lakes. So if I bought one today at 5 o'clock p.m., I'd have until 5 o'clock p.m. That is tomorrow. correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I'd move the item. Is there a second. second? All right, let's, and it passes unanimously. It will be moved on for a public hearing in two weeks. Uh, item 9F uh, is another presentation, and Aubrey's coming back up to talk to us about. Good morning again. Good morning. I am here to present the eligibility criteria and guidelines that um, are proposed for the General Obligation Limited Tax Affordable Housing Program, the GOLT Affordable Housing Program. And uh, together with partnership with the Alliance for Economic Development, Brent Bryant, and um, the planning department, we came up with the, with the guidelines and criteria that would be used to establish this program. And so this, this did become a part of the 2017 bond, the GOLT authorization, uh, for $60 million for the entire GOLT bond, but it was council's intent that $10 million of that portion for community and economic development be applied to the establishment of an affordable housing program. So we're happy to see this uh, coming forward, trying to put some parameters around the guidelines that would be used to administer the program. And um, I could say as a planner that I'm happy to see this because it supports many of our community and economic development goals in our comprehensive plan that help us create housing choice and diversity, encourage mixed income neighborhoods and developments, and address the need for affordable housing in Oklahoma City. And I wanted to give you some um, background on that. You've probably seen these presentations before that quantify our need in Oklahoma City for affordable housing. I wanted to highlight that um, Oklahoma City residents, a, a portion of Oklahoma City residents do pay more than 50 percent of their income toward housing. And for every 100 existing households that do pay more than 50 percent for housing, Oklahoma City has five units that are built. So you can see there's a gap in the number of units that exist for those households that might be income uh, challenged, and low-income renters are the most vulnerable group. And unfortunately, rents are increasing, um, and so it makes it harder for people of low and moderate income to afford to even rent. So um, the other thing is we're trying to balance that existing resources that we have for federal funding and, and programs are limited in their scope and application, or those resources are declining. 
So by establishing this program, it provides another source of incentive and support to develop affordable housing in Oklahoma City, and we do have high opportunities for that. So in summary of the program that I mentioned, um, the $10 million is the allocation out of the uh, gold bonds, and our goal is to allocate approximately a million dollars a year over the course of, of the bond, but no more than $2 million per project. This helps us distribute those funds across Oklahoma City and, and reach as many people as we possibly can. So there's no limitation on the size of the project. The projects could be large or small, but we are expressing some preferences that they be located in mixed income neighborhoods and that those locations have access to quality schools and transit. We also would be able to assess a proposal and allocate these funds proportionate to the number of affordable housing units that that development would like to construct. The process for the application is similar to other processes that you all are familiar with and that the applications would be accepted by our economic development program manager, which is Brent Bryant. And then city staff would, would perform due diligence in looking at the proposed project, evaluating it based on the applicant's experience, their financial viability, and the program parameters and guidelines. And an affordable housing review committee would be established. And that committee um, would consist of members appointed by the city manager and would include representatives from the city itself, the Alliance for Economic Development, the Oklahoma City Housing Authority, and the Oklahoma City Finance Agency. So the Affordable Housing Review Committee would re evaluate projects and make a recommendation. Then it would come before the Oklahoma City Economic Development Trust and then finally City Council. In terms of the requirements for eligibility to receive funds, we've established a threshold that the units must be affordable to households that have incomes at or below the 80% mark of the area median income. We do list a priority if they could meet 60% of the area media income. Um, these funds are really, uh, they are available based on uh, need. So this would be the but for clause that the project wouldn't exist if not for these incentives to be offered. Um, and typically payments that we would make are normally made after performance is proven, but of course the Oklahoma City Economic Development Trust where City Council have the ability to waive that requirement for exceptional projects, and then they would establish a clawback provision uh, for those projects. We've also uh, initially thought a 20-year affordability period would be appropriate. And then, I don't know why this keeps slipping. Okay, the next slide is uh, the preferences. So we have a list of preferences, and the preferences wouldn't be 100% or you don't get the funding. It would be that we would evaluate preferences, and hopefully the majority of the preferences would be met. So I've listed a few of those preferences. Locational preference is one issue. Um, we would also like people to integrate um, affordable housing into market rate projects and uh, mixed income neighborhoods that we might uh, locate some of these affordable housing in our revitalization areas in Oklahoma City. Of course, the 60% area median income is a preference and that the projects could serve residents with needs such as the elderly and disabled and if they are proposing to develop, redevelop an abandoned building or a brownfield. So the uh, Oklahoma City Economic Development Trust and the City Council have this on their agenda as a joint resolution. The Oklahoma City uh, Economic Development Trust heard this at their June 28th meeting and adopted the resolution, and we're asking uh, Council's approval. And I do have our team behind me again, so if there are any questions I can't answer, we'd be happy to help. So why I want to build uh, 40, 40 units of affordable housing, and um, there's a million dollars per year. How, as far as my application is concerned, is that based upon the number of units? Is it based upon uh, square footage, about funds that I may be entitled to? We, the, um, the guidelines say that up to $2 million a year could be issued, $2 million could be issued maximum per project. So if a project came in that was a large scale and they met all the criteria and we would evaluate that project for what their needs would be, um, and there's, there are no specific ratios or numbers or anything that you could establish like per square foot, but you could potentially approve a project to get up to $2 million. The million dollars a year is the goal based on how many projects we think are feasible and, and appropriate and practical to come seek assistance 
and to make sure that, that those funds are going to be available for a long duration. But of course, the program guidelines are subject to something coming forward that um, might need adjustment, and that's based on the recommendations of our um, process. Aubrey, uh, is, are there efforts to verify throughout the 20-year life that these requirements are being met in mm -hmm. terms of, of uh, providing for uh, affordable housing, the percentages? Yes, they, they would have to be established and monitored and uh, proven to still comply. Who the does housing. the monitoring? Uh, we were thinking that the planning department might be a good resource to do that. We administer our uh, HUD funds, and um, we're very familiar with what the requirements would be. And are there requirements for maintenance in terms of, of the quality of the facilities, in terms of you know, proper lighting, proper landscaping? Uh, if there's multiple stories, the, uh, the railing along uh, the stairs, things like that, beyond just normal code enforcement? Uh, in, in the guidelines, there are no specific provisions for specific types of building materials, but it does express the desire to have high quality projects. And typically what we do is work with a proposer or developer on issues. If there, if there are compatibility issues with the design of the project, those are some of the considerations that have flexibility on our end to seek. But of course, you know, in, if the project meets building code or design districts, they're really entitled to be able to have flexibility in design. No, I understand starting out. I'm saying over the life of the facility, do we ensure... Oh, that they maintain it? That they maintain it. I think it would just be subject to the city's standard uh, property maintenance requirements and ordinances. Thank you. Aubrey, in terms of um, priorities for how... Uh, developments are approved. So Mark wants to do, you know, 40 units um, in Ward 8, but it's out, you know, on the outskirts of the city. It's still within the city limits. Or, you know, is there a priority for doing or encouraging more infill in the city, you know, say I want to do 40 in Ward 7 and it's more uh, infill than it is, you know, pushing us out to the outskirts of the city. We talk about good schools and those kinds of things, you know, how is that going to be a priority for how the development is going to happen for affordable housing? Uh, the, the preferences do acknowledge uh, priority to locating facilities in areas that can support community and access to jobs and schools. So that could exist anywhere, be it outlying areas or downtown. So. Uh, the other priority does talk about revitalization efforts and areas that uh, the city is already currently working to do in fill and revitalization. So that is listed as one of the preferences. Um, also redeveloping those abandoned buildings and brownfield sites. So we are, we are trying to give preference to projects that are doing the things that the city is working towards in terms of uh, what you're mentioning, quality neighborhoods, infill development, build, rebuilding existing neighborhoods. Um, one of the preferences in here does dissuade apartment buildings being located in clusters of apartment complexes. That's one of the that's one of the policies in the comprehensive plan is that we don't continue to create large um, areas of just apartment buildings. We like to encourage mixes of of housing types and levels of income. So if a project came in to do a whole bunch of of small units in an area where there were already a, a bunch of small units, we probably wouldn't. Um, favor that location. Any other I just questions? want to piggyback on Lee's. This, this is so teed up for transit oriented development. I mean, I just want to beg whatever. I mean, it just seems like, but make sure it's on a transit line. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're, that's a natural fit. It it goes to Lee's. You're not gonna you're not gonna put it in the periphery of the city where there's not transit. I mean, that that kind of guarantees infill and it guarantees you get that. Mm -hmm. Those who need affordable housing right. have a, a transit component. I mean, it's a natural yep. fit. Yes. This whole program just seems completely teed right. up for transit-oriented development. Right. And I hope that those, I mean, I know on here you have employment, quality schools, transit, and grocery store as the four. I, I, I just, I wish tra transit gives you access to grocery store, employment, mm -hmm. 
quality schools. So I hope transit is number one, and transit-oriented development in particular is number one. The second question is, we're using median household income as our, as our benchmark, which is 47,000, I believe, in Oklahoma City. That's somebody having a $24 an hour job. I mean, not even our teachers, most of them make that much money. 23% of our population in Oklahoma City lives below the poverty line, which would be like four for a single, would be four times less than this number. So 80% of that would be like 38,000. That'd be like somebody making a $19 an hour job. I mean, that just, does that seem high? I know, that, I know you're giving preference to 60%, but why is the 80% number even in there? I mean, that just seems too high. Not, not even a huge amount of our teachers make uh, $37,600, 38. And I'm not sure what the ratios are in Oklahoma City in terms of housing uh, types that are offered for different income ranges. It could be that the 80% is the place at which housing becomes less available to people who can afford housing. Um, and I know that that's a, it's a consistent uh, benchmark for most federal funds and programs to look at that range. Um, so I'm not really sure. I, I don't really know the statistics or facts, but maybe I just, Kathy. I just want to make sure. Let me. The, the bigger issue is that we don't have somebody that comes in and, and it's really a development for the wealthy, right? And they put in just enough affordable housing for those making 80% of the median income, which to me is not the highest priority. And then they qualify for something like what we do with our TIF funds where we give 6, 7, 8% for something that really is a, a development for the wealthy. But they put, they put in just enough we, and we've had some of that, where it's like 80% the Wheeler District, right? Some of that that was considered affordable housing, and to others might not be so affordable housing. Well, I think, I think one thing to keep in mind is that rents in certain areas, and especially in some of these highly pref preferred areas, are, are higher than market. So what we're trying to do is, is get some units in those places that are accessible to people with lower incomes, so that you don't have to make 120% of AMI to afford to live downtown, for example. So is so. Okay. I'm sorry. I mean, you know, so what we're and what we're really pushing for is a mix of incomes. You know, that that some some units might be available for people at 60% of AMI. And then others would be 80, and others would be market rate within the same development, so that you get you get an average AMI for the whole project. You see what I'm saying? I mean, the real the real trend in these projects is to mix the incomes. I mean that I mean that's everybody knows that that's a better way to develop these things, and and that's you know what we're I, seeing across the and country. And I understand that. I mean, especially with the gentrification that's happening, we're building a place where only the wealthy can afford to live downtown. But but is hmm. that going to be the priority? Is downtown development? Where we I don't think it's going to be the priority. I mean, what we really would like to do is to you know become more proactive with these funds and figure out a way to attract. You know, to find an area, you know, to, to identify an area that meets our preferences and try to find a development that, that can go in there. So, I, you know, I think we, we, you know, we need to look at it a little bit differently than maybe how we've done some of our TIF projects in the past. Do you think we can, what it's is a that? Very, and it's a very limited amount of money, so we need to be right. pretty, um, pretty careful with how we spend it. Why not cut it off at 60%? That's still so, such a huge percentage of the population. Well, and that, that is our preference. Um, so, I mean, that's what we were trying to address through that. Well, what does that mean, it's your preference? I mean, well, it's, your, it's the policy's preference. It's not, you know, that, that we were trying to get the 60% AMI. Okay, thanks. I'll do that. I really applaud what all of y'all are trying to do here, and I think it's something we badly need, for sure. A um, couple of questions. Can you define affordable housing for me? <laughs> Brent or Kathy? This is, this, is, this is one of those uh, 
very technical When someone phase says affordable and, housing, and have, I always struggle with it because what one person might think is affordable housing, yeah, 80% right. of our population might say, that's crazy. There, there right. are a couple different things. So, you know, and I think there's, the, the, this is something that the term affordable housing struggles with because everybody automatically thinks of, um, of housing that's provided by a public housing authority, for example. Public housing authorities typically provide housing for people who make 30% of a area median income or less. So we're talking about people who are very poor. Um, so the, low, the federal low-income housing tax credit program, though, is targeted for people who make 60% of AMI. So these are and people who work, people who make you know, a decent living, um, but that is the, and it's called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. So there's a 60% AMI program, there's 30% AMI federal programs. Um, there are not very many um, programs that are available locally. More and more cities are beginning to do what Oklahoma City is doing and adopt their own programs to, to complement and provide additional resources for affordable housing that, that can help us address a broader spectrum of income levels. I mean, typically, we like to use the term workforce housing because many, most of, most of the individuals who live in these houses work. And, um, you know, the 80 to 120 percent of AMI projects are definitely usually categorized as workforce housing. And I think what we really would like to, to change the, the vernacular a little bit and talk more about work, workforce housing instead of affordable housing. High quality schools. You said it needs to be near high quality schools. Yep. Can, can you define high quality schools? Well, schools that don't have an F rating would probably be a, I mean, there are measures of that. Um, you know, and so um, one of the things that I think we all would like to see is an improvement in some of our inner city schools so that they're, that they're not um, poor choices and poor and, and, and impact that ability for location of affordable housing. Well, thank you. All righty. Any other questions or comments? <clears throat> Aubrey, thank you very much. Um, is there a motion to move this forward? Move forward. Second. Ready? Cast your votes. And that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, item 9G, uh, Doug Cupper is coming back to talk to us about our Wayfinding Master Plan. Good morning, Doug Cupper, Director of Parks and Recreation for the record. Uh, the uh, Pathway and Trails Committee that has been working uh, diligently ever since it uh, came into existence to not only map out where our expansion of trail systems should be, they also help the Parks Department uh, uh, determine the walking paths that are internal to park systems as well. One of the things that has uh, come up over the last five years is safety and trying to find your way around our 80 miles of trail system. Uh, in 2014, uh, February of 2014, the uh, City Council approved um, hiring uh, Cardinal Engineering to do a study for wayfinding signage along our trail system. Uh, as we progressed through the timeline that you see there, uh, we had a number of public meetings, uh, not only the Pathways and Trails meetings being public meetings, but they had subsequent uh, meetings uh, with the jogging public, the bicycle riding public, and uh, let alone neighborhoods that are adjacent to our trail systems. They uh, started to formulate the concept of what the trail signs should be. And some of the things that came out of those meetings was the obvious. Here's where you are and where you're going, showing you how far you have to go to get your, to your destination. Uh, case in point, if you are entering the river trail system at Meridian Landing, where a lot of our visitors fly in and stay, how far is it to downtown? How far is it to Bricktown? How far is it to the boathouse district, those things the tourists are coming to town for to visit that are used to walking from Europe and Asian countries. So 
So we wanted to make sure that we have that ability to tell people where, where they're at, what their starting point are, and then how far it is to those, those destination points. Another thing that came up during the, the thing was trail etiquette. Because of our lack of sidewalks, our trails, our, multi, our bicycle trails as they originally were intended to be, evolved into multi-use trails because neighborhoods discovered them and they started using them for their neighborhood exercises. The Burke Cooper Trail is a prime example. It was primarily developed for bicycling around Lake Hefner, but the public started using it for walking. We added additional sidewalks to try to separate those two, but etiquette. You know, walk on the right, pass on the left, announce your approach and things along those lines. So it was real important to, to get as part of this wayfinding educational materials in there in the form of, of trail etiquette. The other thing that came up, uh, and it's been real prevalent in the four years that I've been here, is we have had injuries occur on our trail system. Some of them are in remote areas. The public didn't know exactly where they were at to be able to call for an ambulance or even a family member to come rescue them to, to uh, bring them back home or take them to the hospital. So having markers along the trail, mile markers, so that people know where they're at on the trail system is very important to, the, to this occasion. So, so the, the Pathways and Trails Committee went through it. Uh, they hired Cardinal to do the analysis. Every single trail, multi-use trail that the city has, they studied and did a price point for us, including the three, at the time, the three proposed map trails. Now, West River Trail has been completed, the Will Rogers Trail has been completed, Stanley Draper is under construction. They even did the analysis uh, for the cost and what kind of trail signs, where they were located, where the, the trailheads will be and, the, and uh, the markers going forward. The uh, Trails Committee, I think, did an uh, excellent job of, of picking an iconic format for the, the wayfinding signs. They picked materials that should be durable and should sustain our weather conditions. They should also be durable enough to sustain vandalism, uh, which has been prevalent on the few trail signs that we have existing now on the River Trail and Burr Cooper, et cetera. Um, they, they really took into consideration bicyclist safety to extend the mile markers out into the turf area so that, you know, uh, again, uh, it's visible, people know where they're at, and we do get runners that wa run on the side of the trails rather than on the pavement. So I think it, it brings quite a bit of quality. We'll be able to have a robust map system in here to be able to you know, tell you where you're at and where you're going down the, uh, down the trail system. One of the reasons that it's taken us the amount of time, obviously, if we go back to the original, on March 13, 2015, the advisory committee accepted the, the, the plans and the trail commitment from Cardinal, and they recommended that this go to the city council for your approval. But one of the things that we're cognizant of, we hate to bring things plans to the council, you have an expectation that they're going to be implemented. Uh, we at the time did not have a funding source to be able to implement the trail wayfinding sign system. And in the subsequent years, we have been able to uh, get some geo bond funding from 2007 for new trails. We're putting that into the scope of services for, for those design consultants to finish out the engineering you know, the fabrication, the footings, and that sort of thing to hold these iconic pieces in the air was the missing link. So now we've got funding. We need the city council's approval to, uh, of the plan. We, we picked the Burke Cooper Trail as an example. You can see how detailed the wayfinding will be, the letters and, uh, that, and the, uh, the diamonds here depict certain types of trail signage. They went through the whole system, and every single one of our trails is this detailed uh, for wayfinding signs to be placed so that uh, it's comprehensive and it's something that we can stay up with going forward with any additional trails. 
So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Again, it's very comprehensive. Uh, we, we hope that you'll accept this plan because we want to be able to initiate the, the, uh, the scope of services for our design firms. Uh, we want to make sure we're ready when the 2017 GL bond for trails, which has the complete package already identified and approved by the voters, as it becomes available, those funds become available or other funds become available, we can initiate this project. Obviously, we have two seated council members that serve on the Pathways and Trails Committee, uh, Mr. Greenwell and Mr. McAtee, served on, serve on the committee and they were a part of the whole design process. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Doug. Questions? The mileage markers, that's a great thing for safety and injuries. And I applaud you for that. Um, when I'm walking out at Lake Hefner, when will I be able to see these kinds of things? Will it be a year from now, two years from now? We're, we're, working, for, we're working towards those efforts to try to get these done uh, uh, sooner rather than later. But it, it's really contingent on the availability of funds. Um, and again, uh, we haven't finished the engineering and the fabrication per se. Uh, we know what the materials are made of. We will know how that we want them manufactured. We're, we're, gonna, we're in the process of, of writing a contract that will come back before you for one of our, our 2007 trails projects. It will be in their scope of services to finish that out. Once that's done, then we're locked and loaded and we can, we can fabricate these and build them and put them in place as the plan called for. So we can, we can get quick reactions. Council, Larry. I've introduced uh, Hal McKnight, the head of the Trails Advisory Committee. He has put all the untold years <laughs> of his life in behind this, and uh, I think he deserves a little recognition. Hal, why don't you come on up if you'd like to make some remarks? We're happy to recognize you and appreciate your service so much. Well, it's a team effort. I certainly appreciate all the work of the Council, Parks and Recreation. I do have the honor of serving on the Trail Advisory committee along with Councilman McAtee and Councilman Greenwell. Um, and we've been doing this for a long time. I'm also on the MAP3 subcommittee for trails and sidewalks. And our city has come a long way as far as a statement with trails which equals health and quality of life. Um, I've been told that half of our residents here use the trail system, which is quite remarkable. Um, we, we were not there. We've come a long way. MAPS 3 has built the Will Rogers Trail, the West River Trail, and is now working on the trail around Draper Lake. Once that's completed, which the projection is early 2019, we'll have over 100 miles of trail. So we feel it's very important to have a good signage package. We, we don't have that. If you compare our city to a lot of cities that have a nice trail system around the United States, there is an obvious need for that. And in our last, I think it was our last meeting for the Trail Advisory Committee, we came up after months of study of recommending two main things to be done on our trails. One, resurfacing the Burke Cooper Trail. If you've been out there, you know it. It's our oldest trail and has the most use, and it's, it's held up pretty well considering, but it, it needs a resurfacing. Um, and the sign package, which is trail etiquette, sort of the good ideas of, of how to use a trail for everyone's benefit, and safety being the key, and the wayfinding idea. Um, I say we've come a long way, but we're not there yet. Um, no, what, no. What are your recommendations <clears throat> on what we need to be doing next? Well, we have funding that's coming forth. Um, unfortunately, I, it's not all the money that I think we need. I think there's the trail signing situation. Uh, Parks and Recreation is doing a rating system on our existing trails. Now, the three trails that were just completed with or being completed with MAPS 3, those guys are going to be fine. But some of the older trails are going to need continual work. So we have an ongoing maintenance need to keep the trails safe and, being for, and dealing with the usage. Um, the signing situation, I think, is, is really important. And these will be uniform. We'll have, we're, we're talking about doing the sign package on all the trails around Oklahoma City. But then where do we go in the future? And we need connectivity. We certainly need to build more trails as we go along. We certainly, in my opinion, need to keep 
the trails at a high standard for people to use. And people identify with these trails. They have a, we have a great, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd probably spend more time on the, on the Lake Hefner Trail. But some of the monies that will come in the future, um, there is some money left over in the MAPS 3 subcommittee for trails and sidewalks. Not very much for sidewalks, not a whole lot of money for, for trails, but some of that money could go to signage, connectivity. Um, the GO bond that just passed, there's $8 million that will come at some point in the future. At my age, I don't buy green bananas, so I, <laughs> I don't, I'm not very patient on, on that. Um, there is funds that will come from the sales tax extension for the community and enhancement advisory board looking at where we it's the funding of about $12 million. Um, that doesn't get you a long way. Uh, and there's certainly a hope that when and if we have a future maps for that funds will be used that way. But it, it really benefits the community. I think it's a, you know, trails, a lot of cities use trails as a marker to bring in other industries for commerce as a healthy Is lifestyle. Is there a long range plan for what you want to do in the future with connectivity and new trails, et cetera? Great, great question. Um, the 1995 master plan is what we have been working on. They hired, the city hired a fellow, uh, Charles Flink from Greenways, and he came in and did a master plan for Oklahoma City. That's what we have been working on. With the conclusion of the MAPS three trails, that pretty well completes that master plan. Planning has been working on what's called, I call it the bike ped plan. It's like, where do we go from here? You now They're doing plans for sidewalks. This city hadn't built any sidewalks since the 60s until MAPS three. We've been rated as one of the most unwalkable cities for many years. But you see sidewalks all over Oklahoma City now. Um, that has, I think, you know, more trails, more sidewalks. The planning department has a really comprehensive plan to move us forward. Um, so, you know, it's, we, we've got some monies from, from the uh, sales tax extension. We'll have some from the GO bond, but those dollars are pretty, you know, 8 million, 12 million. That doesn't go near as far enough. I think it's essential to connect all the trails in the city. And so we're not, we're not there at this time. The 2007 bond calls for a deep fork trail to be built, which would basically connect from McGinnis High School east out to the Katy Trail. And uh, there's also a connector that's not far from here that would connect where the Katy Trail comes into Oklahoma City to the River Trail and then also southeast from there. But I think a lot more study will, will be required. Um, we're going the right way. We're not there. We need to continue. Thank you. Hal, we really appreciate all your service. You've got a great vision for this. Great. It's, uh, it's an honor to be in, to be involved. All right, thank you so much. Thank you all. Any other questions? Anybody else? Thank you. Great. Thank so you so it's much. It's really significant for our city, and I want to thank uh, Larry and David for kind of being our representatives on this whole deal. One of the things that people always ask um, me when they're visiting our city is why are we so unhealthy? And hopefully all of that is going to change. So thank you. All right, so do we have a motion to uh, approve the Wayfinding Master Plan? Is there a second? Please cast your votes. And the plan passes unanimously. Thank you all very much. Um, items H1, we have H, I, J, K, and L. Each of these are salary continuations, and each meet the criteria. Is there a motion to approve um, item 9H1? And that passes unanimously. Nine uh, I one is to approve salary continuation for Corporal Jeremy Meadows. Motion and second. That passes unanimously. Item J is a resolution for Major Dwayne Torres. Second. Motion passes unanimously. Item K is the resolution approving the salary request for Corporal Jason Woods. 
That motion passes unanimously. unanimously. Item L is the resolution continuing the salary for Sergeant Max Sue. Yeah. And that oops, I'm sorry. And that passes unanimously. Um, item nine M is a resolution authorizing the municipal councilor to enter into a settlement in City of Oklahoma City versus Kojak Portable Buildings. I understand we do not need executive session on this item. Do not. Do not. Okay, so that item uh, passes unanimously. Item um, 9M1 is a resolution approving uh, Chief City's uh, request for indemnification in the case of Philip Williams versus the City of Oklahoma City. I understand we do need executive session for that. A short one. Yes. So motion to move to executive session. Second. Second. We'll move that to executive session by unanimous vote. And then we had a additional item added to the agenda. Well, first we have oh, Q. First I have Q. Oh, I'm sorry. First I have O. Uh, and we do need executive session. This is a resolution authorizing uh, us to negotiate a legal service contract for the purpose of uh, the discussing the op opioid litigation. Yes. Second. Second. We'll move that to executive session by unanimous vote. Okay. And then we had an extra item that was added to the agenda, which is a resolution authorizing the municipal counselor to confess judgment and settle the case of Philip Williams versus the city of Oklahoma City. We have a motion to move that to executive session. Second. Second. And we will move that to executive session by unanimous vote. Item 9F are claims that have been recommended den for denial. And I believe we have someone here to speak on one of those claims. Uh, Jeffrey Schmidt. Hi. Hi, would you like to come forward? Thank you. As you do so, would you please state your name and address for the record? And thank you for being so patient to sit through the meeting. We really appreciate your perseverance. It's uh, Jeff Schmidt, and I live at 2517 Northwest 60th Street in Oklahoma City. Uh, on January 1st, a uh, water main outside my home burst, and uh, the great folks at the water department repaired it, and they repaired my driveway, which was dug up in repair of that line. Um, they did damage my sprinkler system, and I have a claim for $426 that I would love the city to reimburse me. Great. Uh, we did see that. We have Tina here from our legal department to speak uh, to the claim and share with you our concerns and our, our reason it's certainly right now for denying the claim. Okay. Um, when the neighborhoods are planted, the city reserves utility easements for the placement of sewer and water and different things. The work done on the water main there was done within the utility easement that the city had acquired to allow us to do just those types of things. The sprinkler system encroached into the easement, which lots and lots of them do, and was uh, unavoidably damaged. Uh, the city is not liable for that kind of damage because our utility easement gives us um, a right to be there to use it as for, for the purpose we acquired it for without incurring any uh, liability for that. So, okay. So I, I want you to say that again. We we are able to work in the easement without incurring any liability for any damage, unless we do something extraordinarily bad. But in this case, they work within the easement to fix the main. They fix the main, and in the course of getting down to the main, the sprinkler system was damaged. For things like that, that where we acted reasonably, we are not liable. So, I mean, the only way we'd be liable is if we were off the. Easement. Right. On his private property. And we specifically asked that question to make sure we stayed within the easement. If we had gone outside the easement and damaged something, then we would be coming with a recommendation to pay for that portion of the damage. But that's not the case here. So the legal advice we as a council are being given is that because it was in the easement, um, we are not responsible. I feel so sorry for you, but was any of it outside of the easement or was it all within the easement? So Thank you for that question. It's my understanding that the system was capped at some point, and that's why the Oklahoma City Water Department was unable to repair it. It is their policy to repair the system if they can. 
So I, I hired a company that found where it was capped, which was, uh, I would say, 20 feet or so from the location of my driveway, which I believe is, well, I don't know. I won't assert that it's outside the easement, but it seems awful far away. When you say 20 feet away from your driveway, uh, in parallel with the street. Parallel to the street. Thanks. The easement does run parallel to the street, from water meter to water meter in that area. Okay. So did the, the main burst under the driveway? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other? I can't tell you what to do, but um, if you had some evidence that it occurred outside the easement, it came back another day with photographs or um, uh, somebody a surveyor, something could be done. But if it's in the east, but there's nothing we can do, I'm so sorry. I mean, I we've had lots of, you know, situations where, you know, if you build onto an easement and something happens, you actually have to take your building down or you have to remove your, you know, whatever the encroachment is. And, and we do need to retain those specifically for the purpose of being able to make repairs. So we are terribly sorry that it happened, but that is the legal basis for our denial. Okay. Uh, I appreciate the explanation. If I had, uh, I was led to believe that the city would pay for it. Uh, $426 is not a small sum of money to me. That's why I'm here today. So um, I would have thought twice about paying for that repair if I knew that it would be automatically denied. So well, We appreciate thank that, you. and we're terribly sorry. Okay. Thank you for your time, and thank you for coming down. Thank you. So uh, we, I need a motion to uh, recommend the claims for denial. Second. Those passed unanimously. Item 10A are claims that were recommended for approval. So a motion to approve those claims. And those claims are approved unanimously. Uh, item 11 are items from council. Why don't we start, James? Ed, anything else? Just a question on that. Do we so do we tell home builders not to put sprinklers? In, I mean, in the easement. Is that they put them in at their own risk? So most of them put it in because that's, that's kind of common. Okay, thanks. Larry, okay. no, Tom. I just want to wish everyone a happy Fourth of July, and uh, remind everyone to be safe. That's it. The safe part's really important today, and um, David. Happy 4th of July to everyone. Yeah, I hope everybody will come out tonight to the fairgrounds. Philharmonic uh, offers a free concert tonight starting at 8.30. It's called Red, White, and Boom. And uh, there will be fireworks at 10 o'clock following. It is an incredible citywide happening. It's very, very fun. Bring a lawn chair. It's going to be warm, but please come out and enjoy the Philharmonic's music. City manager reports. I see none today mm -hmm. have any claims and payroll. None. Already, and I see zero citizens. So I guess there are no citizens to be heard. Uh, we have executive session, and then we'll be back.
right, we have returned from executive session and um, we are on item 9N1. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? And is there a second? Second. Second. Cast your votes. That item passes. Is that correct? Minus. Minus. Here we go. Okay, guys, sorry. sorry. Come on. <laughs> we are voting on item 9N1, which is the resolution to indemnify police chief city in the case of Philip Williams versus the city of Oklahoma City. We had a first, uh, we had a motion and a second, and it passes unanimously. And then the second item of business is 901, which is a resolution uh, authorizing and directing the municipal counselor to negotiate a legal service contract on behalf of the city of Oklahoma City. Oh, I miss, we missed something. Yeah, we need to do the amendment that was part of our packet. Thanks. So the extra item that was part of our agenda um, is a resolution authorizing the municipal, municipal counselor to confess judgment and settle the case of Philip Williams versus the city of Oklahoma City. Is there a motion to do so? Move the item. And is there a second? The extra item. No. Yeah. Okay. So is, it, is there a second? Second. Okay, cast your votes, and that motion passes unanimously. So then we are on to item O, which is the resolution authorizing and directing the municipal counselor's office to negotiate a legal service contract on behalf of the city for the purpose of filing litigation at no cost to the taxpayers in response to the opioid epidemic. That is resolution number one under item 9-0. Motion to, is there a motion? Is there a second? Second. second. Cast your votes. And that vote passes uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight, seven to one. Thank you very much. I believe that concludes our business and we are adjourned.